Hello everybody. I would like to record a short pre-lecture here that deals with three topics as you can see in the title. Solution stoichiometry. I just want to highlight that again to make sure you're thinking correctly about that. So I won't spend too much time on that. We'll then talk about two different types of reactions that occur in aqueous solution. Solutions where water is the solvent, precipitation reactions, and then acid-base reactions. So let's just get started. So again, stoichiometry. Here's the key. Let's say moles of substance 1, and we want to get to moles of something else in that reaction, substance 2. Okay, That's the key to stoichiometry, and I think you all know that. And the way we get from the moles of substance 1 to the moles of substance 2 in a balanced chemical equation, remember, you need a balanced equation because you need the correct mole ratio as identified by those coefficients in the balanced equation. That's the key. If you want to go from one thing in the reaction to something else, we do it in terms of moles. Now, what you're probably more familiar with, and we've, we had done a lot of these calculations before the last quiz, a lot of times we would start with grams of this first substance. Okay, Grams of substance 1. And then we would use the molar mass to convert to moles. We know how to do that, right? And then we might then apply our mole ratio and then convert to moles of substance 2. And then the problem might ask you to find grams of substance 2. Okay, And we know how to do that again. We would use the molar mass of substance 2. All right. So a lot of students, not a lot, but some students try to memorize stoichiometry and say, OK, I take grams, I use the molar mass to convert to moles. I then use the mole ratio to convert to moles to something else, and I use the molar mass to go to grams. Don't memorize. This is the key step, moles to moles, using the mole ratio. You might be asked to do other things in the problem, and this is where we get into solution stoichiometry. Quite often in solution stoichiometry, you're not going to start with grams of solution because your solution has two components, solute and solvent. So we have to express the amounts of both of those. So grams are not the way we would do that. And common unit we're going to use is molarity. So quite often in solution stoichiometry you're going to take molarity times liters to get to moles. All right. So molarity would be given say in the problem you might have volume in milliliters but that doesn't cause any problems but molarity times liters will give you moles of that substance then you can apply the mole ratio to get to moles of something else. Now Solution stoichiometry. For this other substance, it might say calculate volume, for example. Okay, so now you have moles of that other substance. It might ask you to calculate volume. Well, what would we need to know? Well, molarity is moles per liter. Molarity would be typically then given. You just solved or calculated moles using stoichiometry. Okay, calculated from stoichiometry, and then we can now solve for volume. Okay, so you can see, you know, this isn't something you want to memorize, but you do need to know, okay, the definition of molarity. I know I can always get moles from molarity in liters, okay, but then a lot of problems, and you will see problems like this, it might say solve for the volume of this other substance. You solve for moles by stoichiometry, molarity given the problem. You can then rearrange the equation to solve for liters. Okay, So be flexible when doing these solution stoichiometry problems. And always remember the definition, and you can always get moles from molarity times liters. OK, that's enough for just re-highlighting solution stoichiometry. Keep working on those. Um, they're a little bit more challenging than the grams to moles type stoichiometry problems. A little bit more challenging. Okay, precipitation. Now here is a solubility rules table. This is actually um, from a different book. Um, I like this one a little bit better than the ones in, in the one in the book, but students uh, last year told me they liked the one in the book better. So you can let me know either way, and um, I will give you either of these on a quiz. Uh, but you will get a solubility rule table, such as this one. You do need to know how to use it. So let me give you an example of a precipitation reaction. And then we'll look at this table. So we're, let's look at the reaction. Let's take sodium 
carbonate. And we're going to react that with, let's say, calcium chloride. Okay. And then let's look at our two possible products. Now, I will try to help you out here in terms of charges by you will have the table up above and that'll help you figure out some of the charges of these guys. So carbonate is up here on the table, two minus, and so sodium must be plus one. And we're gonna assign charges so we can predict our products, okay? So the reason why sodium needs to be plus one is, is plus one, and you can see that in the table up here as well. There are two of them, two times plus one is plus two to balance the minus two. These salts, these are all ionic solids, um, will be electrically neutral, okay? Same thing, you'll find chloride is Cl minus. Um, I don't know if calcium, yeah, calcium's up in the table, but you could figure it out two times minus one, calcium must be plus two. Now, the reason why we need to do that is we need to figure out the formula of our product, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna switch our cations and anions. We're gonna, you know, uh, I didn't say that right, but let me just draw lines here, it'll be easier to see. Okay, so we're gonna take the cation from one salt, combine it with the anion from the other. So it's Na plus, and this is why we need the charges, with Cl minus. All right, there you go. Char charge is already balanced. Next salt, take the cation from one salt, combine it with the anion from the other. Calcium two plus, combined with carbonate. Charge is balanced, we're done. Okay. Now, sometimes the charges won't be balanced, and you're going to have to add subscripts to balance and make the, the substance electrically neutral. So that's how we write out one of these precipitation reactions in terms of figuring out our products. So we're going to exchange, take the cation from one salt, combine it with the anion from the other. Same thing here, cation from one salt, anion from the other. Assign the charges first so that you can then predict the formulas of the product. All right, that's one step, and, I'll, and, and we'll write these rules out later, um, not in this pre-lecture, but kind of the step-by-step -step thing to write out these reactions. So, what are we gonna do with this now? Well, the first thing we should do is figure out, if you, this is defined as a precipitation reaction, something might come out of solution as a solid. Let's try to figure out what that is. But before we do that, let's look at our reactants to make sure they are soluble. And that will typically be the case. So we scroll up to the top of the table. The very top part of this table, so from here down to here, those are soluble compounds. So it says, it says compounds that contain alkali metal ions are soluble. Well, here we have a sodium ion, it's an alkali metal. What we do to indicate solubility is we write AQ after it. What does that mean? Aqueous, it's in solution. Okay, that salt has dissolved in water and is hydrated by water. What about calcium chloride? Oh, well look, chlorides generally are soluble. Now there are some exceptions, and these exceptions would be insoluble. So chloride combined with silver ion, mercury ion, lead ion would be insoluble, but calcium is not on that list. So most chlorides are soluble. Put AQ to indicate solubility. All right, let's go to our product. What about sodium chloride? Yeah, sodium salts are soluble, chlorides are soluble. You know that table salt, sodium chloride is soluble. What about our last salt on the list? Calcium carbonate. We don't see calcium up at top on soluble. We don't see carbonate on the either. But now we get to the section of the table that lists insoluble compounds. And so all of these below that tend to be insoluble. Carbonates tend to be insoluble. Almost all of them, except if it's with an alkali metal ion or ammonium. Now ammonium, I don't know if it's shown on here. Yeah, it is, it's up here. Ammonium is NH4+. Okay, that's a polyatomic cation, all right? So carbonates in general are insoluble. If it's combined with an alkali metal ion, it is soluble like sodium carbonate here but this one is going to be insoluble. It's gonna come out of solution as a solid, so we write S for solid, insoluble, okay? So lots of stuff going on in this reaction. 
So a couple things to note. You do have to be able to know how to use this table, and I went through that. You might have problems that just say, you know, which compounds are soluble, which ones are insoluble. Use the table. Okay, something simple as that. Now, writing out the reaction is a little bit more complex because, as you can see, we assigned charges to the reactants first. We exchanged our cations and anions. We made sure the charges were balanced. This was an easier problem because they turned out to be balanced right when we combined them. Okay, now we identify what's soluble, what's insoluble. Lots of stuff. And then you're probably saying, wait, we're missing one thing here. Ah, it's not balanced. And so some of you probably were go. You were probably going, Dr. Kirkshank, Dr. Kirkshank, stop. Uh, but you'll notice that there's two sodiums and two chlorides on the left, and only one each on the right. Does that cause any problems? No. How do we balance an equation? We balance with coefficients. So all we have to do to balance this equation is put a two. Okay. So don't change subscripts because that would change the formula. Since it's plus one and minus one, it's going to be one to one, one sodium for every one chloride. So we're not going to add subscripts of two. We balance with coefficients. So now I do have two sodiums, two chlorides on the right, to balance my two chlorides, two sodiums on the left. One calcium ion, one carbonate, one calcium, one carbonate. Already done. Okay. So we will practice more of these in class, writing out precipitation reactions and identifying the precipitate. We will do more of these. You will have this table that has the charges of the, the things listed, so that can kind of guide you in the process. All right, And uh, we'll actually talk about other ways to write these as well. But know how to use a solubility table. Typically, these are broken down. I think the one in the book is the same. Top part of the table lists predominantly soluble compounds with some exceptions that are insoluble. Then the bottom part of the table lists things that are predominantly insoluble, so you know carbonate salts. Now again, remember these salts will have a cation and anion, but if the anion is carbonate, they tend to be insoluble. Phosphates tend to be insoluble, which is PO4, 3 minus. Chromate, sulfides, hydroxides tend to be insoluble. Okay, The exceptions, and let me go back, get rid of this red pen, I don't like red. The exceptions on the insoluble insoluble part of the table would actually be soluble exceptions. So again, carbonate with alkali, metal ion, something like sodium ion, would be soluble. Okay, Learn how to read the table because some problems will be straightforward. Is this compound soluble or insoluble? You look at the table to find it out. Writing reactions, you still have to be able to use the table to predict will something precipitate. All right. Enough of that for now. We will do more with precipitation reactions in class. And the last thing I want to talk about, and I thought I was going to write more there, but um, acids and bases. So a couple of things to keep in mind. So we've covered so far in this pre-lecture, solution stoichiometry, precipitation reactions, third thing on the list, acid-base reactions. You do need to know the common strong acids and strong bases in particular. And here's the list of the six common strong acids. Okay, And I don't ask you to memorize too much stuff in this course, but you do need to memorize the six common strong acids. And, and this actually, we'll talk, I, I typically don't consider calcium hydroxide to be a strong base. We'll talk about these but memorize the strong bases as well. All right. And the reason why you should memorize these is that any other acid or base you come across will be a weak acid. Okay, So these guys, these are acids. They're not strong acids, so they're weak acids. We'll talk about the difference in a minute. The only weak base you need to know for now, and for this course, is ammonia. And we'll talk probably in class about why ammonia is a weak base. All right, so know the six common strong acids. You've heard of some of these. Hydrochloric, you know, very common strong acid, hydrochloric acid. In the same family, right below chlorine is bromine and iodine. So then there's two more, hydrobromic, hydroiodic. Nice pattern there. You've heard of these other ones, nitric acid. You might not know the formula, HNO3. Sulfuric, H2SO4. The one that's probably least common on this list 
is perchloric, HClO4. But know the six strong acids. Any other acid you come across will be a weak acid. How do we identify a weak acid? Well, acids generally, as you can see them written, are written with hydrogen starting the formula. Um, I'm going to write some acids differently than your book tends to, like acetic acid. I'm going to write it like this. Okay, so that formula provides a little bit more information about how things are bonded together in that compound, a little more structural information. And the reason why I like to write these like this is because of this group there. And you may have heard the name for this group, COOH, which actually looks like this. It's a du C double bond O, so there's a double bond, and then OH like that. But COOH, that's called a carboxyl group. Have you heard that term before, carboxyl? And hence, the acids that have carboxyl groups are called, I think you know the answer, carboxylic acids. Okay, so carboxylic acids, and that's why I like to write them like that so you can see that, what's called a functional group. Okay, carboxyl, this carboxyl group is what we would call a functional group. You see that functional group and right away you know it's an acid, and right away you know it is a weak acid. Okay, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the, about the difference between a strong acid and weak acid in just a moment. So, know your six strong acids. Any other acid you come across is going to be a weak acid. How do we identify acids? They either start with hydrogen in the formula or they contain a carboxyl group. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about the difference between a strong acid and a weak acid. Strong acids ionize completely. Okay. So you might remember that an acid, as definition, you may have heard this before, so this is something that we need to know. An acid, let me write it down here, is a hydrogen ion donor. Okay, So that's one definition of an acid, hydrogen ion donor. So all these acids have an H+. Plus. In a carbo carboxylic acid, it's going to be the hydrogen of the COOH group is going to be the one that's donated. But we're going to donate initially, if it's just the acid in water, that H plus will be donated to water. Producing, so when water gains an H plus, we're now going to have three hydrogens. And since it was H plus, it's going to have a positive charge. It's going to produce H3O plus. These are all salt in solution. Water is a liquid. This strong acid is soluble, aqueous. All right. And then the other thing we're going to get H plus, that must mean that we have Cl minus. We'll get Cl minus in solution. Okay. Strong acids ionize completely. This reaction goes 100% to product. Okay. At least we're going to assume that. It doesn't quite get there. It doesn't quite get 100%, but really, really, really darn close. So much so, in fact, we're going to assume that it goes to completion. And it pretty much does. Okay. So that's a strong acid. Let's compare that to acetic acid, which is a weak acid. How do we know acetic acid is a weak acid? It's a carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acids are weak acids. But this acid is still going to be a hydrogen ion donor. So this is just the acid in water. We're going to look at one more reaction in a minute where we actually react an acid with a base. Donate an H+, plus. Okay, hydrogen ion donor. Again, producing hydronium. You see how this is the same re type of reaction as above. And when acetic acid loses an H+, plus, we're going to be left with this whole other anion left, right? This was an H+, plus, so this whole thing left over has a minus one charge. And it's actually, since it comes from acetic acid, this is the acetate ion. You don't need to know that, but the names make sense. Acetic acid, the anion is called acetate. Okay, But you can see the parallels. Both acids produce H3O plus and an anion. Okay, Difference, a couple of differences here. Strong acid, ionizes 100%. Weak acid, 
only partially ionizes. So this is a weak acid. Right? Partially ionizes weak acid. And by partial ionization, we mean it actually doesn't ionize to a great extent. And we actually draw double-headed arrows to show that this, this is what's called an equilibrium. And we actually won't do equilibrium in this course till next semester. But for now, it means that the reaction can go both directions. And in the forward direction, this reaction only goes about 1%. Okay? So about 99% stays as this acid, and only 1% goes to product. All right, so these only ionize to a very, very small extent, weak acids. Okay, strong acids 100%, weak acids only about 1%. All right, let's talk a little bit about bases. Oh, let me, let me one, one more thing I would like to highlight in this before we go to bases. Sorry about that. Another definition of an acid, different than it's a hydrogen ion donor, is that acids produce hydronium ion, H3O+. So that H3O+, ion is called hydronium. You may have heard that before. And you can see whether it's a strong acid or a weak acid, it produces hydronium ion in water. Okay. Um, let's go scroll back up for a second and look at our strong bases. Look at what all of these have in them. That is a polyatomic anion called hydroxide. Okay. And what we see then is bases produce hydroxide in water. That's one definition. Bases produce hydroxide. So if we take, I wish I could scroll down just a little bit more. There we go. If we take sodium hydroxide, this is actually a soluble hydroxide salt. Now there would be more strong bases, but if you look back at your solubility table, most hydroxide salts are insoluble. It is essentially only the ones that are combined with the alkali metal ions and barium ion. Calcium is kind of slightly soluble, so I'll give you the list in just a minute. But there's very few soluble hydroxides. The ones that are soluble, we dissolve those in water, and they're going to completely break apart into their component ions. Okay, this is going to go 100%. Soluble salts, this is a salt, Na plus hydroxide. Remember, salts are typically going to be a metal cation with some anion, which can be a non-metal anion or a polyatomic anion, like this one. Okay, we talked about how to identify ionic solids. Okay, so soluble salts, ionic solids, we will assume 100% break apart into ions, what we call dissociation. All right, and so bases produce hydroxide. That is one definition of a base. Okay, so compare acid to base. One definition of an acid, acids produce hydronium ion in water. Bases produce hydroxide in water. There you go. All right, so another definition of a base, and we'll see this for ammonia, and I just want to highlight this one definition of another definition of an acid. Uh, base, I'm sorry. So this is the only weak base I expect you to know. All right. Oh, and I just did that. Uh, well, well, I was going to save that for class, but that's okay. Um, the reason why, and we're going to draw structures and molecules later in this course, but it turns out that the nitrogen of ammonia, and we'll talk more about why this is later, has what's called a lone pair of electrons. Okay, E apostrophe S for electrons, lone pair of electrons. So we have a lone pair. We put this base in water. Okay, so a base, another definition of a base is a hydrogen ion acceptor. Hydrogen ion acceptor. So note the parallel, look back up above. Acid is a hydrogen ion donor. The base is a hydrogen ion acceptor. Okay, so water really doesn't quite have an H plus in it. We'll talk when we do more about structure. We'll talk that the hydrogen is partially charged, 
but we can look at water donating an H plus and the base, ammonia, accepting it. And the reason why ammonia can accept a positive ion is it has two electrons there that it can donate to this positive ion. Okay, So when ammonia gains that H+, plus, what do we produce? So it was NH3, now it's going to be NH4 because we gained a hydrogen, but we gained an H+, plus, so this is going to have a positive charge. This is ammonium. Okay, it is soluble. And when water loses an H+, plus, what are we going to be left with? So it's H2O, we lose a hydrogen. We're just going to have one hydrogen and one oxygen left. And because we lost an H+, plus, it's going to have a negative charge. And what is that? Ah, hydroxide. Bases produce hydroxide. So there's the both definitions together with a weak base. For this strong base up top, we only we don't see we do, you know it just produces hydroxide. So we're going to use that definition. But for weak base, we can talk about it accepting a hydrogen ion. That's one definition of base. But it also produces hydroxide. All right. So last thing, I think I've done enough for this pre lecture. I was going to do more. I was going to look at reacting an acid with a base. But let's uh, let's stop here for now. This is a, this is enough stuff I think. But Look at water. Water is donating an H+. Look at your definition up here. An acid is a hydrogen ion donor. So what is water in this case? It's actually functioning as an acid. It's donating an H+, to the base ammonia. So these really are acid-base reactions, where water in this case is functioning as an acid. So we dissolve a base in water. Water functions as an acid. Let's go back up to our our acid HCl, that's donating an H+, plus. that's an acid, but look at water. What is water doing? It is accepting an H+. Plus. So what does that make water? Ah, hydrogen ion acceptor, that's the definition of a base. Okay, let me scroll back down. I wrote it down here, base. Hydrogen ion acceptor. So water, depending on what we dissolve in it, if we dissolve an acid in water, water functions as a base. Okay, If we dissolve a base in water, water functions as an acid. Okay, So acid, these are acid-base reactions depending on what you dissolve in water. In class, we'll spend a little bit more time looking at what if we took something like hydrochloric acid and mixed it with sodium hydroxide? What would that reaction look like? But let's say that this is enough, I think, for a pre-lecture. Um, just to summarize, we've gone through three things in this pre-lecture. We talked, we kind of highlighted solution stoichiometry again, focus on that, very, very important. And then we highlighted two different types of reactions. Precipitation reactions, know how to use the solubility table, um, know how to exchange cations and anions to predict your two products, balance the equation, and so on. Predict what precipitates from solution using that solubility table. We'll practice more of those in class. Acid-base reactions, okay? Make sure you know the definitions of acids and bases. Okay? Make sure you can acid in water. Acid is a hydrogen ion donor. Okay? And write out these reactions. Bases produce hydroxide. So the strong bases are just the soluble hydroxide salts. Weak bases, you have to use the other definition of a base, that it's a hydrogen ion acceptor. And let me do the last thing, and I said I wasn't going to do any more. I meant to highlight what I consider to be the six strong bases. They're easy to remember. Really, the soluble hydroxides, we just go down, um, sorry, I forgot lithium. Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium. Alkali metal hydroxides are soluble. And then barium hydroxide is also considered to be soluble. Calcium hydroxide is kind of borderline, so let's not worry about that. That gives us six strong bases. Okay. So these again are the ions, you know, something like lithium hydroxide, lithium plus one, hydroxide minus one, sodium hydroxide. Now barium is actually two plus, so we're going to need two hydroxides to balance a plus two of barium. Okay, but soluble hydroxide salts are strong bases, and there's not too many that are soluble. All right, I think that's enough. Sorry to ramble on for so long. 
All right, I will see you in class. Take care.